Plotinus was a major philosopher of the ancient world. In his philosophy there are three principles. The one, the intellect, and the soul. His teacher was Ammonius Saccus and he is of the Platonic tradition. Historians of the 19th century invented the term Neoplatonism and applied it to him and his philosophy which was influential in late antiquity. Much of the biographical information about Plotinus comes from Paul Frey's preface to his edition of Plotinus Aeneids. His metaphysical writings have inspired centuries of pagan, Christian, Jewish, Islamic and Gnostic metaphysicians and mystics. Biography Porphyry reported that Plotinus was 66 years old when he died in 270, the second year of the reign of the Emperor Claudius II thus giving us the year of his teacher's birth is around 205. Unipus reported that Plotinus was born in the Deltaic like a polish in Egypt, which has led to speculations that he may have been a native Egyptian of Roman, Greek, or Hellenized Egyptian descent. Plotinus had an inherent distrust of materiality, holding to the view that phenomena were a poor image or mimicry of something higher and intelligible vi I, which was the truer part of genuine being. This distrust extended to the body, including his own. It is reported by Paul Free that at one point he refused to have his portrait painted presumably for much the same reasons of dislike. Likewise Plotinus never discussed his ancestry, childhood, or his place or date of birth. From all accounts his personal and social life exhibited the highest moral and spiritual standards. Plotinus took up the study of philosophy at the age of 27, around the year 232, and travelled to Alexandria to study. There he was dissatisfied with every teacher he encountered until an acquaintance suggested he listen to the ideas of Ammonius Saccus. Besides Ammonius, Plotinus was also influenced by the works of Alexander of Aphrodisias, New Menace, and various Stoics. Expedition to Persia and return to Rome after spending the next 11 years in Alexandria, he then decided, at the age of around 38, to investigate the philosophical teachings of the Persian philosophers and the Indian philosophers. In the pursuit of this endeavor he left Alexandria and joined the army of Gordian III as it marched on Persia. However, the campaign was a failure, and on Gordian's eventual death Plotinus found himself abandoned in a hostile land, and only with difficulty found his way back to safety in Antioch. At the age of 40, during the reign of Philip the Arab, he came to Rome, where he stayed for most of the remainder of his life. There he attracted a number of students. His innermost circle included Porphyry, Aemilius Gentilianus of Tuscany, the senator Castricius Firmus, and Eustochius of Alexandria, a doctor who devoted himself to learning from Plotinus and attending to him until his death. Other students included Zethos, an Arab by ancestry who died before Plotinus, leaving him a legacy and some land, Zoticus, a critic and poet, Paulinus, a doctor of Scythopolis, and Serapion from Alexandria. He had students amongst the Roman Senate beside Castricius, such as Marcellus Orontius, Sabinilus, and Rogentianus. Women were also numbered amongst his students, including Gemina, in whose house he lived during his residence in Rome, and her daughter, also Gemina, and Amphicle, the wife of Ariston the son of Iamblichus. Finally, Plotinus was a correspondent of the philosopher Cassius Longinus. Later life while in Rome Plotinus also gained the respect of the Emperor Gallienus and his wife Salonina. At one point Plotinus attempted to interest Gallienus in rebuilding an abandoned settlement in Campania, known as the City of Philosophers, where the inhabitants would live under the constitution set out in Plato's laws. An imperial subsidy was never granted, for reasons unknown to Porphyry, who reports the incident. Porphyry subsequently went to live in Sicily, where word reached him that his former teacher had died. 
the philosopher spent his final days in seclusion on an estate in Campania which his friend Zethos had bequeathed him. According to the account of Eustochius, who attended him at the end, Plotinus' final words were, Strive to give back the divine in yourselves to the divine in the all, the six Enneads, translated by Stephen McKenna and B. S. Page, Eustochius records that a snake crept under the bed where Plotinus lay, and slipped away through a hole in the wall. At the same moment, the philosopher died. Plotinus wrote the essays that became the Enneads over a period of several years from California, 253 until her few months before his death 17 years later. Porphyry makes note that the Enneads, before being compiled and arranged by himself, were merely the enormous collection of notes and essays which Plotinus used in his lectures and debates, rather than a formal book. Plotinus was unable to revise his own work due to his poor eyesight, yet his writings required extensive editing, according to Porphyry. His master's handwriting was atrocious, he did not properly separate his words, and he cared little for niceties of spelling. Plotinus intensely disliked the editorial process and turned the task to Porphyry, who not only polished them but put them into the arrangement we now have. Major Ideas 1. Plotinus taught that there is a supreme, totally transcendent, 1. containing no division, multiplicity or distinction, beyond all categories of being and non-being. His, 1, cannot be any existing thing, nor is it merely the sum of all things. Compare the Stoic doctrine of disbelief in non-material existence, but is prior to all existence. Plotinus identified his, 1, with the concept of good, and the principle of beauty, I, 6.9, his, 1, concept encompassed thinker and object, even the self-contemplating intelligence must contain duality, once you have uttered, the good, add no further thought, by any addition, and in proportion to that addition, you introduce a deficiency, 3, 8.11, Plotinus denies sentience, self-awareness or any other action to the one, v, 6.6. .6. Rather, if we insist on describing it further, we must call the one a sheer potentiality or without which nothing could exist. 3, 8.10, as Plotinus explains in both places and elsewhere, e.g., v, 6.3, it is impossible for the one to be being or a self-aware creator god. At v, 6.4, Plotinus compared the one to, light, the divine nous to the, sun, and lastly the soul to the, moon, whose light is merely a, derivative conglomeration of light from the, sun. The first light could exist without any celestial body. The one, being beyond all attributes including being and non-being, is the source of the world, but not through any act of creation, willful or otherwise, since activity cannot be ascribed to the unchangeable, immutable one. Plotinus argues instead that the multiple cannot exist without the simple, the less perfect must, of necessity, emanate or issue forth from the perfect or more perfect. Thus, all of creation emanates from the one in succeeding stages of lesser and lesser perfection. These stages are not temporally isolated, but occur throughout time as a constant process. Later Neoplatonic philosophers, especially Iamblichus, added hundreds of intermediate beings as emanations between the One and humanity, but Plotinus' system was much simpler in comparison. The One is not just an intellectual conception but something that can be experienced, an experience where one goes beyond all multiplicity. Plotinus writes, we ought not even to say that he will see, but he will be that which he sees. If indeed it is possible any longer to distinguish between seer and seen, and not boldly to affirm that the two are one, emanation by the one Plotinus offers an alternative to the orthodox Christian notion of creation ex nihilo, which attributes to God the deliberation of mind and action of a will, although Plotinus never mentions Christianity in any of his works. Emanation ex dio confirms the absolute transcendence of the one.
making the unfolding of the cosmos purely a consequence of its existence. The one is in no way affected or diminished by these emanations. Plotinus uses the analogy of the sun which emanates light indiscriminately without thereby diminishing itself or reflection in a mirror which in no way diminishes or otherwise alters the object being reflected. The first emanation is Nous, identified metaphorically with the demiurge in Plato's Timaeus. It is the first will toward good. From Nous proceeds the world soul, which Plotinus subdivides into upper and lower, identifying the lower aspect of soul with nature. From the world soul proceeds individual human souls, and finally, matter, at the lowest level of being and thus the least perfected level of the cosmos. Despite this relatively pedestrian assessment of the material world, Plotinus asserted the ultimately divine nature of material creation since it ultimately derives from the One. Through the mediums of Nous and the world soul, it is by the good or through beauty that we recognize the One, in material things and then in the forms. The essentially devotional nature of Plotinus of philosophy may be further illustrated by his concept of attaining ecstatic union with the One. Porphyry relates that Plotinus attained such a union four times during the years he knew him. This may be related to enlightenment, liberation, and other concepts of mystical union common to many Eastern and Western traditions. The true human and happiness the philosophy of Plotinus has always exerted a peculiar fascination upon those whose discontent with things as they are has led them to seek the realities behind what they took to be merely the appearances of the sense. The philosophy of Plotinus. Representative books from the Enneads. 7. Authentic human happiness for Plotinus consists of the true human identifying with that which is the best in the universe. Because happiness is beyond anything physical, Plotinus stresses the point that worldly fortune does not control true human happiness and thus, there exists no single human being that does not either potentially or effectively possess this thing we hold to constitute happiness. The issue of happiness is one of Plotinus's greatest imprints on Western thought, as he is one of the first to introduce the idea that eudaimonia is attainable only within consciousness. The true human is an incorporeal contemplative capacity of the soul, and superior to all things corporeal. It then follows that real human happiness is independent of the physical world. Real happiness is, instead, dependent on the metaphysical and authentic human being found in this highest capacity of reason. For man, and especially the proficient, is not the couplement of soul and body. The proof is that man can be disengaged from the body and disdain its nominal goods. The human who has achieved happiness will not be bothered by sickness, discomfort, etc., as his focus is on the greatest things. Authentic human happiness is the utilization of the most authentically human capacity of contemplation, even in daily physical action. The flourishing human's act is determined by the higher phase of the soul, even in the most dramatic arguments Plotinus considers. He concludes this only strengthens his claim of true happiness being metaphysical, as the truly happy human being would understand that which is being tortured is merely a body, not the conscious self, and happiness could persist. Plotinus offers a comprehensive description of his conception of a person who has achieved eudaimonia. The perfect life involves a man who commands reason and contemplation. A happy person will not sway between happy and sad, as many of Plotinus' are contemporaries believed. Stoics, for example, question the ability of someone to be happy if they are mentally incapacitated or even asleep. Plotinus disregards this claim of, as the soul and true human do not sleep or even exist in time, nor will a living human who has achieved eudaimonia suddenly stop using its greatest, most authentic capacity just because of the body's discomfort in the physical realm. The proficient's will is set always and only inward, overall. Happiness for Plotinus is, a flight from this world's ways and things, and a focus on the highest, i.e., 
forms and the one against causal astrology Plotinus seems to be one of the first to argue against the still popular notion of causal astrology. In the late tractate 2.3, Are the Stars Causes? Plotinus makes the argument that specific stars influencing one's fortune attributes a rationality to a perfect universe, and invites moral turpitude. He does, however, claim the stars and planets are ensouled, as witnessed by their movement. Plotinus and the Gnostics at least two modern conferences within Hellenic philosophy fields of study have been held in order to address what Plotinus stated in his tract against the Gnostics and who he was addressing it to, in order to separate and clarify the events and persons involved in the origin of the term Gnostic from the dialogue. It appears that the word had an origin in the Platonic and Hellenistic tradition long before the group calling themselves Gnostics, or the group covered under the modern term Gnosticism, ever appeared. It would seem that this shift from Platonic to Gnostic usage has led many people to confusion. The strategy of sectarians taking Greek terms from philosophical contexts and reapplying them to religious contexts was popular in Christianity. The cult of Isis and other ancient religious contexts including Hermetic ones, Plotinus and the Neoplatonists viewed Gnosticism as a form of heresy or sectarianism to the Pythagorean and Platonic philosophy of the Mediterranean and Middle East. He accused them of using senseless jargon and being overly dramatic and insolent in their distortion of Plato's ontology. Plotinus attacks his opponents as untraditional, irrational and immoral and arrogant. He also attacks them as elitist and blasphemous to Plato for the Gnostics despising the material world and its maker. The Neoplatonic movement seems to be motivated by the desire of Plotinus to revive the pagan philosophical tradition. Plotinus was not claiming to innovate with the Enneads but to clarify aspects of the works of Plato that he considered misrepresented or misunderstood. Plotinus does not claim to be an innovator, but rather a communicator of a tradition. Plotinus referred to tradition as a way to interpret Plato's intentions, because the teachings of Plato were for members of the academy rather than the general public. It was easy for outsiders to misunderstand Plato's meaning. However, Plotinus attempted to clarify how the philosophers of the academy had not arrived at the same conclusions as the targets of his criticism. Influence Ancient world The Emperor Julian the Apostate was deeply influenced by Neoplatonism, as was Hypatia of Alexandria, as well as many Christians, most notably Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. Saint, Augustine, though often referred to as a Platonist, acquired his Platonist philosophy through the mediation of the Neoplatonist teachings of Plotinus. Christianity Plotinus' her philosophy had a great influence on the development of Christian theology. In A History of Western Philosophy, philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote that, To the Christian, the other world was the kingdom of heaven, to be enjoyed after death, to the Platonist, it was the eternal world of ideas, the real world as opposed to that of illusory appearance. Christian theologians combined these points of view, and embodied much of the philosophy of Plotinus. Plotinus, accordingly, is historically important as an influence in moulding the Christianity of the Middle Ages and of theology. The Eastern Orthodox position on energy, for example, is often contrasted with the position of the Roman Catholic Church, and in part this is attributed to varying interpretations of Aristotle and Plotinus either through Thomas Aquinas for the Roman Catholics or Gregory of Nyssa for the Orthodox Christians. Islam Neoplatonism and the ideas of Plotinus influenced medieval Islam as well, since the Sunni Abbasids fused Greek concepts into sponsored state texts and found great influence amongst the Ismaili Shia. Persian philosophers as well, such as Muhammad al-Nasifi and Abu Yaqub Sijistani, by the 11th century, Neoplatonism was adopted by the Fatimid state of Egypt, and taught by their Dari, 
Neoplatonism was brought to the Fatimid court by Hamid al-Din al-Kirmani, although his teachings differed from Nasafi and Sijastani, who were more aligned with original teachings of Plotinus. The teachings of Kirmani in turn influenced philosophers such as Nazir Kushrur of Persia. Renaissance In the Renaissance the philosopher Marsili Officino set up an academy under the patronage of Cosimo de' Medici in Florence, mirroring that of Plato. His work was of great importance in reconciling the philosophy of Plato directly with Christianity. One of his most distinguished pupils was Pico della Mirandola, author of an oration on the dignity of man. Our term, Neoplatonist, has its origins in the Renaissance. England in England, Plotinus was the cardinal influence on the 17th century school of the Cambridge Platonists and on numerous writers from Samuel Taylor Coleridge to W. B. Yeats and Kathleen Raine. India Saab Pali Radhakrishnan and Ananda Kumaraswamy used the writing of Plotinus in their own texts as a superlative elaboration upon Indian monism, specifically Upanishadic and Advaita Vedantic thought. Kumaraswamy has compared Plotinus' teachings to the Hindu school of Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta and Neoplatonism have been compared by J. F. Stahl, Frederick Oppelston, Aldo Magris and Mario Piantelli, Radhakrishnan, Gwen Griffith Dixon, and John Y. Fenton. The joint influence of Advaitin and Neoplatonic ideas on Ralph Waldo Emerson was considered by Dale Reaper in 1967.